In the British services, when the trigger is pulled, the button pressed, the shot fired, the absence of problems is taken for granted. Weapons, ammunition, bombs, missiles, vehicles, they're all expected to function perfectly and remain safe under all conditions. The fact that they do is not just a gratifying accident, it is that indefinable part of excellence, the quality factor. Quality in weapons, in ammunition, in vehicles, is the business of the Quality Assurance Directorate Ordnance, Quad Ord for short. It's a main support organisation for the procurement executive, which is the purchasing arm of the Ministry of Defence. As modern as today's technology requires, it's based in the Royal Arsenal at Woolwich, with a tradition that takes in some rather well-known historical figures in its 500-year history. Admittedly, in Wellington's day, matters were a trifle less sophisticated, and yet it's oddly reassuring to scan the old documents and find there the same principles of thoroughness, the same demand for excellence. Nevertheless, it was a haphazard system, and as the 19th century's industrial progress came to be reflected in the armaments industry, an increasingly dangerous one. So, in 1887, the Morley Committee's report established the principle of independent inspection and demanded quality by applying the most rigorous standards from first design. Gradually, the imposition of systematic testing and proof of both weapons and ammunition brought a new discipline to every stage of manufacture. Standards rose, and it was no coincidence that the rest of the world's opinion of British arms rose too. By the First World War, the direct inspection system was well entrenched, and the Arsenal girls, as they came to be called, successfully took over the traditionally male preserve of armaments a move that justified what the suffragettes had been saying for a decade or more. They too had to get used to the idea that no matter what they were doing, the inspector was never far away. By the 30s and 40s, the standards to which the girls were working were significantly tougher than anything private industry was asking for. Then, gradually, it all changed. And by 1973, the old direct inspection system was largely superseded. So, what had happened? Well, what happened was this. A series of defence standards known as the 0520 series was brought in, and that related directly to NATO quality assurance standards. Now, it's quite simple. Whether you're an outside contractor or a Royal Ordnance factory doesn't matter. You're forced to establish your own quality assurance. In other words, Quad Ord is monitoring the system instead of doing it all themselves. Now, when a new piece of equipment comes along, the procurement executive appoints a project manager and that piece of equipment is his baby. So Quad Ord hands it to one of its stores officers and from the moment the idea is first committed to the drawing board, he is involved in all the design, development and testing to ensure that quality is built in at every stage. For a time, there is little or nothing to see, just endless drawings, endless Only meetings. Then. And at all of them, Quad Ord is there, its representatives probing, satisfying themselves that the problems are being overcome, the standard maintained. On your shoulder, you'll then see that the balance is then about right, indicating the ergonomic factors. Yeah, I see that, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in discussing the length of the launcher, I think we're approaching the question of not all burnt on launch. Have you any views on that? We have, in fact, got a film that we can show you now that shows the magnitude of the problem, the difficulties we've got to overcome. Fine. Um, yeah. We'd like to see that, please. Right. Could we have the film, please? Here we see the launcher on the left of the screen, the projectile being fired from left to right. 
The camera lights are now on. Ignition, projectile fired, and there we see all the motor efflux, the gases and the particles given off. I think that illustrates the uh, a typical launch sequence which we have to study to answer your question. Ian, I know there's a constriction on the length of this tube. How do you intend to uh, go about minimising the effect of rocket motors burning after they leave the launch tube? There are several techniques we can choose. Um, we've chosen fault tree analysis as the most appropriate, and this is a way of looking at all the undesirable ways which could result in not all burnt on launch. Mick has produced a chart which we'll run through showing the way... That and when any store, whether it's a vehicle, a weapon or ammunition, is either under development or in production, it is tested and proved relentlessly. We test it in various ways. It's important to know whether the round in flight has shed any of its bits. The 30 millimeter round has a driving band on. So recovery is done by firing into a cork box. An enormous quantity of small granules of cork are there to slow down the shot without unduly damaging it. Then you empty the cork out, recover your projectile and examine it to see whether there was any loss of bits and pieces during flight. One very important test that we do for NATO is to test any new type of ammunition before it's given the NATO seal of interchangeability. And one of these tests is of barrel wear. There is a standard set rate of fire that must be achieved by this test weapon. And we continue to fire at very high, these very high rates. And the criteria for a barrel being shot out is A, when the velocity drops considerably, and B, when the bullets that are coming out at the end of this barrel are going through the target sideways on. Of course, Vulcan is a very high-speed weapon, and in fact, that cold means we have the only ground-mounted test piece that will fire Vulcan ammunition at its full rate. This uh, weapon is coughing out 20 millimeter shells at a rate of 6,000 rounds a minute. Now, imagine these high-explosive shells striking the stop butts. Unless you had stop butts weighing many, many tons of really good quality armor plate, you'd be through and shooting up the nearby village in no time. <laughs> Before a single shell is fired, a great deal has happened to it. It has, for a start, been manufactured under conditions of such stringency that they verge on the clinical. At this Royal Ordnance factory, the 155mm shell for the FH-70 is being made. Royal Ordnance factories still manufacture 95% of all Britain's weapons and ammunition, and notwithstanding their official status, are expected to conform to the same stringent standards as any outside contractor and throughout manufacture the shell is subjected to a comprehensive series of quality assurance measurements and tests to ensure that it is up to standard. Shells are sectioned to check on the filling process and together with the containers in which they travel are submitted to a series of rigorous environmental tests. Take this standard NATO pallet for 155 millimeter shells it could be used to the desert. We blast it with sand to make sure it isn't harmed by it. They'll travel over some rough patches of country, so we simulate that to make sure they don't get damaged and that there's no risk of malfunction. They could be used in the Arctic. 
We freeze them down to the lowest temperature that they're ever likely to meet. They've still got to work at the end of it. They may have to stand out in the pouring rain. We have to know that it won't affect them. And when we've done all that, we drop them from a 40-foot tower. This simulates a shiploading accident, at the end of which those shells not only must not blow up, but should be capable of being loaded and fired. Uh, program round one three, load. Can Roger. Before we fire, we carefully examine and inspect the ammunition and take various measurements and we then fire them into water which is deep enough to receive them without the shell actually hitting the sea bottom and damaging them. Four, three, two, one. Can I check correct? The bore is clear. And then when the tide goes out, it reveals the sands or the mud flats. And we then drive out onto the sands and pick them up in vehicles and take them back into the laboratories where they're once again examined and measured and make sure there's no deformation after firing. Tests on vehicles are conducted just as thoroughly, and not just on vehicles, but on individual parts. This tank has been in service for some time, but it's driving on experimental tracks. The requirement for these tracks is to survive being driven hard over one of the toughest courses in the world. This time, they didn't make it. What happened, Jody? Uh, I don't know yet, uh, There's a horn bent. Now, uh, best to go for um, Samson then? Yeah. Take this bit back to the lab. Right. And so, once it's been rescued, back to the lab it'll go. But does such a failure represent disaster? Good Lord, no. No, the, the track link on that tank was a prototype, a track link. 
and obviously this doesn't go onto the normal tanks until it's gone through a whole series of tests uh, to ensure that it is satisfactory for that particular type of tank. The track link uh, is subjected to a whole series of tests to find out whether in fact it is uh, the fault of the manufacturer or whether it is um, the fault of the material or whether it's a, it's a design fault. In the first instance, we were under the impression that it was the pin that had bent. But on being sent to the laboratory here, investigation showed that it was the track link that had broken, that it was a fracture of the track link. A scanning electron microscope showed up intergranular cracking, which would indicate that it was a material fault. Obviously, once we found the answer to the problem, our job was over. But someone, somewhere, is going to want to know why it happened and how it happened. For every vehicle, every component, the testing is rigorous. This tank transporter is driven round a test track for many hours to assess its suitability for service use. It's driven fully loaded over concrete blocks in a test that shakes every rivet in its body. And back at the Woolwich Laboratories, its Rolls-Royce engine is undergoing separate tests. We've got this engine under test for a 400 hour NATO specification running. During the running, we will be testing its performance ensuring that the fueling is correct, power is correct, everything is correct about the engine. We will then dismantle the engine, check its parts for wear to ensure that the services are getting the engine that we've asked for and the specification is called for. It's a thorough process, as thorough now as it was when the contractor was assessed for his suitability a task for which the quality assurance representatives have themselves been carefully trained. To sum up then, gentlemen, contractor assessment is the very foundations upon which QAD ordnance operations are now built. I would remind you yet again about the, uh, what contractor assessment is about. It is the technical appraisal of a firm's capability to undertake defence work. It is concerned with systems and levels of quality. Given its new relationship with both Royal Ordnance Factories and outside defence contractors, Quadord decided to divide the country into five regions, with each regional office responsible for the day-to-day -day control of perhaps as many as a thousand contractors. On average, a quality assurance representative gets to see each contractor once every three to four weeks. Well, we found it was just an isolated case where the material from the subcontractors was wrong. We've got the new supplies in now, this is one of them, which I think you should find is OK. That's much better. It's our job to make sure that design, production and testing is carried out to the requirements of the contract. And also, of course, to the requirements of the, one of the 0520 series defence standards. But whilst we set those standards, it is the contractor's responsibility to exercise proper quality control. So he must be thorough, because he knows that if we decide to carry out testing uh, ourselves, this will be very stringent, and he has no chance to put through substandard work, even if he should want to. And in the manufacture of lenses, the standard is very, very high. It's got to be. If a lens, which superficially seems fine, turns out on checking to be 12 millionths of an inch out, as this one is, that to the manufacturer is a semi-finished lens. Well, this is the next batch of sites for delivery to the Ministry. You'd like to pick out which one. It's one of the Quality Assurance representative's jobs to take random samples from finished production and to send these off to the Woolwich laboratories for testing. Take this one then, Jeff. 
0968. That might include night vision sites, daylight sites, laser systems, surveillance systems. And they're sent into the laboratories where we perform some critical analysis, detailed measurements of the characteristics and performance of those sites and components. Obviously, to do such measurements, then we require some sophisticated equipments. Uh, dealing with optics, we're generally working to within millionths of an inch in tolerances and we have equipments that are able to measure those parameters. For instance, we have optical transfer function measuring equipment, um, probably the most sophisticated in the world, um, which we use to measure the characteristics of lenses. Although most quality assurance work is done on a visiting basis, some defence contractors are big enough to justify having a QAD representative permanently on site. When that happens, a different relationship develops. Well, Ken, I've asked you along here to see this is about the 100th vehicle we have uh, now tested in this tank. And uh, to save a lot of time and manpower, I was going to ask if you would consider a relaxation in the specification to allow us to, to float only about one in five vehicles. How many vehicles did you say? 100? Well over a hundred by now. Must be by now, isn't it? Yes. Actually, when I get the request, I will almost certainly grant the relaxation because the production over the last 12 months has been consistently within the specification requirements. The only rider that I would add is that we will have a 1 in 10 full specification check to ensure that the quality is maintained. Maintaining standards is no simple matter. It's not just a question of checking what is manufactured. It is the checking of the inspection instruments themselves, all of it with the greatest accuracy. There is a calibration standard to which manufacturers have to conform, and this entails having traceability to national standards. This means that the contractor will have some very sophisticated equipment to ensure that his gauges, tools, measuring equipment conform to the national standards. We are talking in terms of accuracy of a millionth of an inch here, and it is our job in the quality assurance field to ensure that the contractor maintains this very high standard of accuracy. The need for accuracy when allied with the sheer complexity of modern technology can make for lengthy development. This breech ring being checked at Woolwich belongs to the armoured version of the FH-70 field gun, the SP-70. Though still at prototype stage, it is clearly a formidable machine. Its testing is pretty formidable too. Strictly speaking, SP-70 isn't a tank at all. It's a self-propelled version of the field howitzer FH-70. And it's a heavy gun being developed for NATO to come into service sometime in the 80s. We do a number of tests on the vehicle. First of all, we do road running for 400 kilometers. And this is designed to test the high speed running of the vehicle and the acceleration characteristics. We then take it down to our cross country course and run it through deep mud and up these steep hills. And this is designed specifically to test out the suspension and whether or not the power pack can withstand the continuous acceleration. Having done something like 10,000 kilometers, we will take the vehicle back to the workshops and we will have to strip it down and assess the wear on all the parts of the vehicle. The whole thing is a continuous quality assurance exercise designed so that when the vehicle does go into production, it is up to specification, and it does the job that NATO requires of it. As always, it's quality which is at stake, and quality which is the driving force behind everything Quadord does. Whether in design, in testing, or in production, it's the quality factor which ensures that at the end of the day, the services will get the very best. <laughs>